Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon. I'm Dave Hellman, and I think it was Robert Frost that said nothing gold can stay. That's what comes to mind on a Tuesday morning. Of course, after such a thrilling week nine Sunday, so many great games, so many down to the wire finishes. Of course, we were due for a dud on Monday night. The L.A. Chargers bury the New York Jets 27 to six to end week nine with a thud. Look, y'all. I pride myself on finding the good, finding the entertaining in every single game we talk about. I love football. I love talking about football. I don't know how much I got for you after this one. Shout out to Darius Davis. That's what I'll say. Shout out to rookie wide receiver out of TCU. Darius Davis for the LA Chargers takes the first punt of the night back to the house to open up an early lead for the Chargers. All well and good. Really exciting play. Turns out it was not a harbinger of things to come other than punts, I guess. Not all of them got returned for touchdowns, but there were 14 more points in the game. Two totally beleaguered offensive lines, the Jets and the Chargers, both just getting annihilated by the opposing pass rushes. 12 combined sacks. Chargers led the way with seven of them. I guess if we're giving out kudos to people, the other guys we'll mention are Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, and the rookie sensation, Tuli Tuli, Tuli Tuli Pelotu. Thought I was going to get that in one try. Probably not getting enough credit for the fantastic rookie season that he's having. They all had multiple sacks. Good for them. Seven combined fumbles in the game. Not all of them lost, but my gosh, was the ball on the turf a lot at MetLife Stadium. I got uh, Keenan Allen. I'll just keep throwing out kudos. Most of them going to the LA Chargers. Keenan Allen manages to reach 10,000 career receiving yards. He's only the second Charger to ever do that, along with Antonio Gates. Good company to be in. I do think Keenan Allen is one of the more perennially underrated players of the last decade or so. Never gets the credit of, of some of the other good receivers, great receivers of this generation. Been in the league since 2013. I don't even know how many people realize that's how old he is. He has been doing it for a long time, doing it at a really high level. That's about all the good stuff I have to say. 27 to six jets went back to looking like the jets. We thought they would be when Aaron Rodgers got hurt. Zach Wilson kind of had an uptick. The jets beat Philadelphia. The jets played competently against Kansas city. Maybe this team's turning a corner. Maybe Zach Wilson's doing it. It, it looked about as bad as I remember it from last year with Zach Wilson trying to get it done. I think the Jets are about to be in for another long week of talk, of criticism, of scrutiny about their quarterback position, about whether they did a good enough job ensuring the spot behind Aaron Rodgers, about whether they should have moved forward with Zach Wilson. Maybe we'll even get to talk more about how freakishly far along Aaron Rodgers looks in his rehab. I don't care. It is very impressive that he's throwing 50 yard bombs during warmups before the game. I got to see a lot more before I believe he'll be back in time to do anything for the jets. I think they would have to make the playoffs and based on that performance, don't see it happening. I will say for as easy as it is to dogpile on the jets, given that the chargers employ Justin Herbert instead of Zach Wilson, they might've looked worse. A really Really forgettable night offensively for the Chargers. 136 passing yards for Justin Herbert. Like I said, he's sacked five times in his own right. I hope you didn't watch it. Even if you're a Chargers fan, I hope you did something else and just checked the score and said, hey, we got the win. We're back to 500, which they are. Chargers are back to 500. They are still alive in the AFC playoff race. They're in second place in the AFC West, obviously far behind the Kansas City Chiefs, but In a very, very muddy AFC, like we all kind of thought might happen, Chargers are right there. I I beg of them to maybe play prettier football moving forward, but with the way the season started, I guess you can't be too unhappy about climbing back to 500. It's really all I want to say about this one, but it does wrap up the football for week nine, and we can move ahead with the news and notes of the week. Chief news item heading into week 10, another bummer of a quarterback injury last week. It was Kirk Cousins this week. 
we get confirmation of what was already feared on Sunday. That's Giants quarterback Daniel Jones has, in fact, torn his ACL. He is done for the rest of the season, as if New York's year couldn't get any worse. They're a bad football team, a, a team that has struggled to score points all offseason long. And however you might feel about Daniel Jones being without the guy that they just signed to a $160 million contract until 2024, just not a fun spot to be. Right now, it looks like the Giants are going to either move forward with Tommy DeVito or Matt Barkley. Tommy DeVito, the guy that has stepped in with Terod Taylor and Daniel Jones out injured for most of this stretch. Maybe Matt Barkley gets a chance respectfully to those guys. And look, I get the games have to be played. Somebody has got to suit up. I get it. But respectfully, I, I don't buy that. It matters from here on out. I think we're now viewing the giants through the lens of a team that is now fighting for the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. If they weren't already, it's a wild place to be. The giants made the playoffs last year. They made the divisional round of the playoffs last year. They got a win in the postseason. A lot of expectations for this team, a lot of anticipation of them taking the next step. Now we're talking about them with a top five, potentially even higher pick in the NFL draft. And it's an interesting spot for the Giants to be because it, it's not a given what they do. Again, Daniel Jones on a $160 million contract, but all of a sudden the Giants looking like a team that's going to have a very, very high draft pick. What comes next? totally overshadows every game. I think the giants are going to play from here on out. And it's not to say they won't win anymore. Been around the NFL long enough to know that's more than likely going to happen. You see surprising results in this league all the time, but now the focus shifts to what Brian Dable and GM Joe Shane are going to do. And I do think it will be Brian Dable and Joe Shane who make this decision. I think winning coach of the year, making the playoffs, winning a playoff game, I assume that buys you the benefit of the doubt that you are the guys to move the team forward in this era. I would be surprised if the giants made a change at the top of their, of their hierarchy. So now the int intrigue becomes what direction do they guide this franchise? Jones signed the extension, $160 million, $40 million a year. But as is usually the case with these types of deals, there's always an out. There's always a way you don't have to finish it. I do think it's hard for the Giants to move on in the year 2024. Jones is now injured. The idea of a trade of a guy who not only has a huge contract, but also a, a major injury that he needs to rehab from seems incredibly unlikely that you could move him in a trade, not realistic to release him either. So 2025, I think, is when it becomes feasible to talk about not having Daniel Jones on the team. So should one year that you don't have or should one year that you are committed to Daniel Jones keep you from doing something bold at the top of the NFL draft, like taking a quarterback, like drafting a Drake may a Caleb Williams name, your quarterback. There's going to be a dozen of them in this year's draft. I would present to you that it shouldn't absolutely not. I know that's harsh for Daniel Jones. I know Daniel Jones has had moments, but this is the fifth year since the Giants drafted Daniel Jones in the top 10 way back in 2019. There have been moments, but not nearly enough that should make the Giants confident that they need to tie their franchise to him any longer than they already have. If you've got to carry him for one more year, maybe you could even have Daniel Jones be your starter until a rookie is ready next year. I think that's feasible. But I do think that's where this heads. I think if the Giants really do that, climb that high in the draft order, not only do I think it's something they should consider, I think it's something they absolutely should do if the opportunity presents itself. That's life in the NFL. Probably harsh for Daniel Jones to hear, but I think he has an understanding of that better than most. Remember, his career began with him replacing Eli Manning, one of the greatest legends in New York Giants history. So it's the cycle of life in the NFL. We'll see where it goes. Hoping the best for, for a healthy, productive recovery for Daniel Jones. Hate to see anybody's season end in an injury, but these are the types of conversations that surround the New York Giants now is what direction does this franchise go? Does it include Daniel Jones in the long term? We'll see what they decide to do. Again, that's, that's months and months away. 
Tommy DeVito, Matt Barkley. We'll see what else they look at in the quarterback department, but a rough year for the New York Giants continuing to get rougher. That's the biggest injury to monitor in the NFC East, but there is another significant one. Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard. If you'll remember, he fractured his forearm on the 28 yard catch and run against the Cowboys on Sunday in the third quarter. Sounds like he's going to be out for about four weeks. I, I football players are incredible. You break your arm and you're like, yeah, give it three or four games and he'll be back and he'll be able to go play 60 snaps of very physical football right after that. It's what happens. It's a blow for Philly, but they did manage without Dallas Goddard for five weeks last year. This, they, this already happened. We've already seen that the Eagles can manage this injury. Obviously AJ Brown and Devonte Smith do a ton of heavy lifting in this offense, but I don't think you should completely discount what Dallas Goddard brings. Obviously he's one of the better tight ends in the NFL and think about when and where the Eagles use him. His first catch on Sunday against the Cowboys picked up a fourth and three that eventually led to the Eagles first touchdown of the day. His final catch, the 28 yarder where he broke his arm gets them down into the red zone. They score a touchdown just a couple plays later with all the attention that you have to pay to AJ Brown and Devonte Smith, the way the Eagles are able to scheme stuff up for him is it's like an easy button for their offense. The 28 yarder, the, the one where he got hurt, it's just an easy little motion across the formation away from the coverage. He zips out into the flat. It's a four yard throw for Jalen hurts and Dallas Goddard does the rest and turns it into a nearly 30 yard gain. So that's the type of stuff that you lose when you don't have an athlete of his caliber, a guy who's going to win as the third option way more often than not, almost always going to have really favorable looks. I do think it'll hinder Philly's offense, but I also think they have the talent to deal with it for at least the next four or five weeks. Be interesting to see. Do they lean on the other tight ends on their roster? Do they ask more of Julio Jones? All of a sudden, you're much happier that you signed him. We'll see what happens, but definitely an injury worth paying attention to. Another one that popped up on Monday, Jamar Chase dealing with a sore back may not play this week against Houston. I just said, Guys come back from broken bones and, and ruptured cartilage and all kinds of stuff in crazy amounts of time. So if Jamar Chase has a sore back that might keep him out of a game a week later, I don't want to know how that guy felt when he woke up on Monday morning after beating the Buffalo Bills. Way too early in the week to know a whole lot else. Something to watch as we get closer to the weekend, but... That's a big storyline as the Bengals prepare to host the Houston Texans. CJ Stroud coming back to Ohio for the first time since becoming a pro. Something to watch there. Keeping it, it's always the injury news, unfortunately. Brutal blow for the Vikings. They traded for Cam Akers earlier this season. Running back tore his Achilles in the Vikings win against Atlanta. That was already a thin position for the Vikings. That's why they traded for Cam Akers in the first place. Now they no longer have him putting even more pressure on Alexander Madison there in Minnesota. Let's keep it in Minnesota, though. The Vikings announcing that they plan to start Josh Dobbs this weekend against the New Orleans Saints. How could they not? The guy won them a game on about two and a half minutes of prep time on the sideline figure he gives you a pretty good chance to win with a whole week to prepare against the saints. That's why you traded for him. Not a big surprise there. Not a big surprise either to hear that Arthur Smith is going to stick with Taylor Heineke Falcons replaced Desmond Ritter with Heineke. They blew it against Minnesota. All due respect to Josh Dobbs and the Vikings, a phenomenal story. One of my favorite stories in the league this year, but if the Falcons are serious about winning the NFC South, which a lot of people pick them to do, it's it's two games now that they should have had that they've blown, but I don't blame Arthur Smith for, if you're going to make the change at the very least have some consistency, you can't be swapping back and forth on a week by week basis. We'll see if Taylor Heineke can do any better against the Arizona Cardinals. Speaking of which, how is this for a noteworthy stat? Kyler Murray expected to start against the Atlanta Falcons almost felt like an afterthought. The, the, the Cardinals are tanking. What's going to happen to Kyler Murray? Is Kyler Murray ever going to play for Arizona again? Yeah, he is. And he's going to do it before Thanksgiving, which is pretty remarkable when you remember how late in the season he injured his knee last year. Kyler Murray's back. I can't remember a situation like this 
And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself just because it, it takes time to come back from a major injury like Kyler Murray's. Don't know how quickly he's going to hit the ground running, but it's interesting to think the Arizona Cardinals are simultaneously in contention for the number one overall pick. They have the worst record in the NFL. They are also now welcoming a franchise quarterback back into the lineup, a guy that they committed a ton of money to is going to be starting for one of the odds on favorites to land at the top of the draft order. The intrigue is off the charts. Is Kyler going to play well enough to sell himself to the new regime is in Arizona? Are the Cardinals potentially going to go on a run now that they have a better quarterback? Does Kyler Murray become some sort of trade bait for another quarterback needy team? There's like a half dozen different directions this could go, and none of it could really start until Kyler Murray was ready to play again. Sounds like that's going to happen against Atlanta. That's exciting for a variety of reasons. Kyler Murray is a very, very fun guy to watch play football, regardless of how good you think he is. You can't deny he's one of the best in the NFL at extending plays making something out of nothing, making you say, holy shit, how'd he do that? Kyler Murray does all of that stuff as well as anyone. Can't wait to watch him play. Can't wait to see what it means for the Cardinals future as well as Kyler Murray's future. So a very exciting development out in the desert heading into week 10. Speaking of exciting franchise quarterbacks, the Houston Texans have one. We got all into CJ Stroud's record setting day against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on Monday. But a day like that, a season like this, deserves a closer look. So I'm joined now by Fox Sports' own AFC South writer, Ben Arthur, to talk about Stroud, to talk about the Texans. Ben, it feels like it's been about a month since I talked to you, I think. And for a minute there, September, October, the talk was, C.J. Stroud's playing great for a rookie. And, you know, oh, he's doing well considering the circumstances. And we're back here in midseason a month later, and I'm not sure CJ Stroud needs qualifiers anymore. He was he was impressive to start, but this thing is taking on a life of its own where CJ Stroud isn't just the face of the Houston Texans, but might already be the best player on that team. Yeah, Dave, we're definitely beyond analyzing CJ in terms of like rookie quarterbacks, right? He's legitimately been one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL this season. And I know Richard Sherman on one of our platforms was saying that he's been a top 10 QB in in the league. And and I would agree. I mean, you look at every major category, he's right there. I I mean, I think at the top of the list, you have uh, the the interception rate. He's he's only thrown one interception this year. Uh, he, He does not put the ball in harm's way. Uh, you know, the passer rating is top four in the league. You know, the touchdown passes is up there. The EPA per drop back, the passing yards. Uh, he, he's kind of checking every box. And, and Dave, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember when seven, eight months ago, people were concerned that because CJ reportedly tested poorly on that uh, S2 c- cognition test, that he wasn't going to pan out as a top QB, but, but he's, he's just a ball player and uh, he he's, he's shown it. He's elevated the guys around him. And, and to your point about CJ really proving that he's just a guy at this point, I think that win over the bucks proved that right. Throwing for, for 450 yards, five touchdowns, no interceptions, his first career game winning drive in a game that had five lead changes uh, you, when you have a franchise quarterback, you, you want a guy who, who's able to maybe transcend the, the issues that you're having as a team uh, in in a tight game when you kind of a, a you need it moment. And and that was his moment, right? Is his first signature win in the NFL. And, and so, yeah, CJ is definitely a guy. I don't think we can no longer just be looking at him in terms of rookie quarterbacks and he certainly had he's on pace having one of the best rookie quarterback seasons ever but he's legitimately been one of the best QBs in the NFL one of my favorite little moments from week nine was after the game's over Texans beat the Bucks at the buzzer thanks to CJ and Jonathan Grenard the Texans edge rusher gets on Twitter and he just says seven is different oh my god and first of all I just love like it took CJ Stroud 
what, eight games to get to a point where you can just call him by his number? First of all, I love that. But I would love to hear from you just how have how has the team embraced him? I mean, I'm sure I'm sure they were impressed with him in training camp. I'm sure throughout this season he has, you know, won over the Texans organization. But when you prove that you can do that, I think it sends an even clearer message to the guys in that locker room about who you are. Yeah, I, I think Dave, it kind of goes beyond what he's done on the field. And, and he certainly has been terrific, but I, I think it's it's the way he's carried himself as a leader. And, and you speak of Jonathan Grenard, and they actually had a moment near the end of that game when after uh, Baker May- Mayfield had that touchdown pass with 46 seconds left, uh, Jonathan Grenard had like his head down and, and CJ kind of stopped him and, and said, uh, n- n- to, to kind of paraphrase, like, I got you. And and th- that's kind of the the messaging uh, that that he's kind of shown th- throughout the year, uh, and, and then even on that game winning drive, like he was telling his old lineman, you know, we 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 got this, guys. Just just give me like a second, and, and like I'll I'll, I'll kind of deliver. And, and so that that's it's it, it's beyond the play. It's kind of the confidence, the demeanor, the swagger that he has that is injected juice throughout the team uh, on, on both sides of the ball. Like everyone is kind of feeding off of that. And, and D'Amico Ryan's at the top. I mean, he's he's been a key part of this as well in terms of changing the culture in Houston. But, but I really think, I genuinely think it's the way that CJ is carrying himself that has had such a big impact on this team. I'm curious for your perspective on this as well. Last time we talked, you know, the the Texans offensive line was a mash unit through the first month or so of the season guys in and out. You notice, I mean, the line seems like it's stabilizing. Not only that, it, it seems like more of a rapport is developing with CJ Stroud and his receivers, Dalton Schultz really coming on over the last month or so. Where do you see the the consistency, the stability of this offense? I mean, it's it's already been pretty damn good. Can it be better? You know, if they continue this run of good health, can it can it reach an even higher ceiling? Do you think? Yeah, I, I do think that, Dave. But I, I think it goes, and I think we talked about this the last time I was on the pod, in that we we still we still need the run game uh, to figure it out, and and. In this Bucks game, this was an example of CJ really transcending uh, the issues that the Texans have in the run game. Like they they only had seven net rushing yards at half. They had barely over 50 yards for the game, and he was able to put them uh, put the team on his back. But uh, like I was saying uh, in the last episode, we did. There's going to come a point late in the season. Uh, CJ is not going to be able to have the same effectiveness getting the ball down the field. And you're going to need to be able to depend on your backs and, and to get chunk yards in, in the run game. And th- they still haven't done that uh, consistently to this point. And so I think that's the thing holding them back to this point to really becoming a great offense and, and to becoming you know, like a really, really serious contender in the AFC. I mean, clearly they're in the playoff hunt, but I think that's still kind of the next step for them in terms of elevating that run game. But, uh, but yeah, this is a team uh, that that is starting to click. As you said, the old line is uh, starting to to pick it up. I I think it's really impressive how Titus Howard, uh, they're really high paid, right tackle has been stepping in at guard and they've kind of had guys in and out at center. And and so they've still been able to have success. And then if you remember, like people were talking, people weren't really confident in this receiving room and and they've really been able to play well. CJ has obviously helped elevate the play of those guys, but Nico Collins is playing at a high level. Tank Dell, who had the game winning touchdown is playing at a high level. Noah Brown uh, had the game of his life uh, last week. And and Robert Woods, who's one of their better receivers, didn't even play. And and, and so so they do have something really positive to to build upon, in my opinion. Yeah, coming from, you know, covering the Cowboys for as long as I did, it it did not go unnoticed that both Noah Brown and Dalton Schultz blew up on Sunday against Tampa Bay. And you kind of alluded to this, and I think last time you were on, we said – Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. This is a young team. This is a young quarterback, but 
man, you look at it, they're a game outside of, of, you know, they're a game out of the playoff hunt. Basically they're one win behind the wild card teams. They've already got a win over the Jags. So I'll ask you the same thing I asked you earlier this season, even understanding that there's, there's more to do. And I think that's a great point that you make about the run game, but are your expectations any different for the Texans than they were even in, you know, early October? Yeah, I, I would not put anything beyond this team just because of CJ's greatness. Uh, so, so I think that's the biggest thing that was that I would say has changed uh, since in the month since we last talked. I mean, we we saw CJ what was still great, right? When when we talked, like he's been great all year, but having kind of that, as I was saying earlier, kind of that signature moment, like a franchise QB type moment, showing that he's one of the few guys in the NFL that can literally put a team on his back uh, and proving that. I think that's the biggest thing that has changed for me. Uh, but but yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say in the last month or so, I, I would be, I would say coming off of this win, I'm a little more confident in the Texans uh, just because of CJ's improvement. And then it, it, you look at it in the framework of the AFC South in particular, I know the Jags have a really comfortable lead uh, in the division. They have a two game lead, but, but they have a really tough schedule uh, in, in the next six weeks. They have two AFC South games. They face the 49ers, the Browns, the Ravens, the uh, I know I'm forgetting another team too. just basically uh, division games and playoff type opponents. And so uh, they've been really hot, but, but there could, there's a scenario where, where they maybe don't kind of keep up this winning streak that they're on right now. And the Texans may be building some momentum here uh, to, to really set up something interesting down the stretch. I'm still confident in the Jags pulling out this division but I, I think the Texans certainly have the po the potential to make it interesting. And then as far as the wild card uh, race goes, as you kind of said, they're, they're only a one game back. And so, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think ultimately, like it really goes back to like my continued confidence in CJ just because what he's because consistency is the biggest thing. Right. And, and what he's continued to do and continue to elevate the guys around him that that makes me even higher on this team than I was just like three, four weeks ago. You mentioned the tough road that's in front of the Jags and it starts this week with the 49ers big game in Jacksonville. Haven't had a lot of reason to talk about the Jags because they were on a bye week but they still do own the longest win streak in the NFL. They are still on top of the division. I guess let's, let's check in with, what they did do during the bye week, which was trade for Ezra Cleveland. I think it seems like a solid move to me, an offensive line that could use a little bit of an upgrade. How do you see Ezra Cleveland uh, adding to the Jacksonville offense moving forward? Yeah, he, he certainly adds depth. And, and you, you would have thought that because of making a move like that, he would just plug right in as a starter. Uh, the Jags have had, kind of some some injury issues up front but Doug Peterson actually said like he he's going to start out as a backup uh the the left guard position seemed to be the spot where he would step in but former but Doug said that former second round pick Walk, Walker Little is kind of manning that spot right now then obviously on the other guard at the other guard spot they have Brandon Sheriff uh who's one of the best guards in the NFL so uh, I think right now he provides depth more than anything, really strong depth at that, right? Like he's started 40 games in, in the NFL, but but ultimately just continuing to fortify that offensive line for uh, Trevor Lawrence and, and for Travis Etienne, who's uh, had a terrific season. And I, I think we we discussed this on our in our last conversation, but we're still we're still at that point where we're where the Jags still haven't completely put it together offensively. And I understand that across the league, it's been a down year for offenses, defenses, defenses seem to be up uh, in general, but uh, the, the Jags are kind of in bottom third in the league in third down efficiency, fourth down efficiency, red zone attempts, red zone efficiency points per uh, points per drive. 
And, and this is an offense as Lawrence in year three, second year with Doug Peterson. They have all these weapons. Uh, and so you, you feel like that this offense still has more to kind of put out there, maybe not meet those crazy expectations uh, of, of the off season, but, but, but they certainly have the talent to, to play better. And, and I think when, when that does happen and, and when it combines with a defense that's playing at a really high level, that's tied for the NFL lead and takeaways, that's getting great play from Josh Allen and, and Darius Williams, who's really been one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL this season. Uh, I think you, you get it. Once you see the offense start to play to its potential more, I mean, this is this is one of the best teams in the NFL, uh, like like a top four, top five team in the NFL across conferences. And so uh, so, yeah, I think for me, like I'm still waiting to see Jacksonville put it all together. And I know they've had some injuries, as I said, but uh, certainly like with the Ezra Cleveland move in particular, f just fortifying that O line for Trevor Lawrence. I agree with you. I, I'm super high on the Jags. And, you know, we, we say the same thing about the Eagles all the time is like, man, they still haven't even really played a complete game. I think you can say very similar things about the Jags being on top of your division, winning five in a row without playing perfect football. Not a bad place to be. Niners are going to be a hell of a litmus test on both sides. I'm glad you, you, you continue to, to bring up the Jags defense and rightfully so, but man, Sounds like Debo Samuel is going to be back for this game. I, I just, I can't wait to see how this Niners offense is going to stress them in a variety of different ways. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a good litmus test uh, for, for the Jags. And, and I think for them, like everything is going right. They, they have that five game winning streak. They haven't lost since September, but, but we want to see how they look against other Super Bowl contenders, right? Other elite teams. Like I, I think, their last, I, I mean, they they beat the the Bills, but but then it, they let one slip away uh, against Kansas City early uh, in the year, and so I think for for the Jags, you want to see them cons play, continue to play at that high level against the opponents that are sort of in their stratosphere as well, and so I think this is going to be a good opportunity to to do that. Ben, we were joking about it before you came on. I just, the thing I love about the NFL is like the play on the field is going to dictate the storylines. And I think before the season, most people would have agreed AFC South may be lacking some juice. And here we are at mid season. You got the Jags rolling. You got CJ Stroud looking like a superstar. We haven't even had a chance to talk about Will Levis. We'll, we'll have you back on to do that. Cause the Titans suddenly look like a much more interesting team. So Things definitely trending up in the AFC South. We really appreciate the time as always. Thanks for having me, Dave. And with that, we can wrap up the show and move into week 10. Not before we handle the angriest part of any week in the NFL season. It's time for the power rankings. Let's start out as we always do. We'll look at the entire league starting down closer to the bottom up two spots from last week. Maybe I should have jumped the Las Vegas Raiders higher. They're up at number 27 after a huge, huge win over the Giants. A resounding 1-0 start for Antonio Pierce, the interim head coach. Maybe the jump should have been bigger. I would like to see a little bit more. It's super impressive. They crushed the Giants. They did it with a rookie starting quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, getting his first win. I would like to see more from the Raiders. I'm curious to see if they can continue that momentum moving on through the season. There are talented players on this team. You've got Max Crosby and Devonte Adams. Just how seriously should we take the Raiders? Their record is way, way better than a team that should be down at all the, all the way at number 27. But we've seen some really, really ugly performances from this team. If Antonio Pierce can get them playing consistently like they did against the giants, I know that, I mean, I've got the giants dead last in the league, so I'd like to see a little bit more, but the Raiders I think can climb and can still have a frisky season, maybe not a playoff season, but a frisky one. We'll see how they do up at number 19, falling four spots this week. I've got the Atlanta Falcons. I alluded to it earlier in the show. The Falcons have now dropped games to Will Levis making his first career start in Tennessee and Josh Dobbs playing after getting traded to the Vikings 15 minutes before the game kicked off. It's inexcusable for a team 
that was picked by a lot of people to win the NFC South. This is a team. Everybody said really the only thing they're missing is quarterback and all Desmond Ritter and or Taylor Heineke has to do is be competent. It's looked a hell of a lot harder than that over the last month. They're one and three in their last four games. And that one win was a win against Tampa Bay, which while it counts, it took everything they had. They turned the ball over three or four different times. They had to move down the field at the very end, walk off field goal. It has not been easy for the dirty birds. I don't know how you call it anything other than disappointing and no, the expectations weren't sky high, but this is a bad division. NFC South is probably the worst overall division in the league, especially now that we've seen CJ Stroud emerge in Houston. It shouldn't be that hard to win this division. The Falcons still can, but it has been a really disappointing couple of weeks. Let's stick there. Number 17, up a few spots. The New Orleans Saints climbing four spots on the week. It's not fair that I've got them this high given the performance. They win the turnover battle against Chicago five to nothing. They only committed one penalty on the day, and it took them until the last 90 seconds to put away the lowly Chicago Bears who were starting Tyson Bajan. Shouldn't be an inspiring performance. They're the only team in the division that won. They're five and four. They are on top of the NFC South. Somebody's going to get a home playoff game. Couldn't tell you who I feel better about. I think the Saints are a flawed team. Their offense can't get out of its own way. Their defense, they did they did get five takeaways, but man, their defense looked a little bit leaky against an offense that maybe it shouldn't have been, not with Tyson Bajan in there, but they are on top of the NFC South for the time being. Falcon Saints have not played yet this year. That's something to watch. I picked the Saints in the preseason. I can't say I feel great about it right now, but I've got them at number 17 by virtue of the fact that somebody's got to win that damn division. Sticking right there in the middle of the pack at number 16, the Minnesota Vikings are up three spots this week after the dramatic win over Atlanta. Right in the thick of the playoff hunt, just like we all expected after an 0-3 start, just like we all expected after Kirk Cousins goes down to an Achilles I don't know how long this magic carpet ride is going to last, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. And keep this in mind, the Vikings play the saints. That's number 16 and number 17. One of those teams is going to be two games over 500 and firmly entrenched in the NFC playoff picture. Obviously for the Vikings looking much more likely that they'll have to do it as a wild card, but given the way the season started, given what they've been through this year, I think they'll happily take that. I wrote this in the article. You can go check it out on foxsports.com. There is an element of this where you look at what's going on with the Vikings. You look at the fact that Kirk Cousins isn't under contract next year, and you say, "Eh, is it really in our best interest to make a playoff run? Are we really a team that can pull this off? I get it. But with Josh Dobbs taking over, let's, let's see how much juice this has. Let's see what you can get out of it. What's what, what else are you going to do? Maybe you can re-sign Kirk cousins in the off season. I don't know. All of those conversations are worth having, especially if you start losing games, but right now they're in the playoff picture. I think that's really fun and maybe they can stay there. If Josh Dobbs can keep that up. All right, let's get up to the top of the power rankings at number seven up four spots. I already thought the Cincinnati Bengals were back. They're definitely, they're firmly back. Now they're as high as they've been since the season started. Remember, another ugly, ugly start. The Bengals are rolling four straight wins. Their last three wins are against playoff contenders, Seattle, San Francisco, and now Buffalo. Joey B looks like Joey B. The defense remains so, so underrated. Guys like Trey Hendrickson, Cameron Taylor Britt don't get enough shine for for what they do. Maybe they're not superstar players. Cincinnati's defense just continues to get results against the juggernauts of the league. Burrow, Chase, Higgins, Mixon, those guys are going to do their thing. The Bengals look like they are firmly back to being themselves. And the funny part is they're actually fourth in their division right now. AFC North looking just as loaded as most people thought they were. Let's finish it up. The top of the league stays the same for week 10. Eagles, Ravens, Chiefs sitting in the top three spots after all three of them get big wins. At number four, though, I've got the Jacksonville Jaguars. They took the week off. They bolstered their offensive line a little bit like we talked about with Ben Arthur. 
I do think this is one of the five best teams in the NFL. They're riding a five game winning streak, but there's no time like the present. Congrats on your bye week. Now you get to face the 49ers. And even, even if the 49ers have lost three games in a row, it's a measuring stick game. Of course it is. It's the first big game the Jags have played since they beat Buffalo in London. They will be firmly tested on both sides of the ball. And if they win, I mean, the sky's the limit. Remember, not to toot my own horn, but yes, I will. The Jags were my preseason pick to be the AFC one seed. All of that is firmly in play, especially if you can beat teams like Buffalo and now San Francisco. We'll see how they do. Really, really excited to see how they handle the test and whether they can live up to the billing of being a top five team. Okay. That does it. I think that that puts a bow on week nine. We're firmly into week 10 as per usual. We will be back on Thursday to preview Thursday night football. We'll get into some, we've got a mid season award show. We're going to hand out some hardware or at least our version of it should be a lot of fun. We'll talk to y'all then go find us on Spotify, Apple podcasts, the YouTube channel. You know what I'm going to say. We really, really appreciate your support. We love doing this with y'all. I will catch y'all next time.